Take our Bibles and turn to the book of Micah, Micah chapter 2. Micah is one of those little books tucked away in the back of the Old Testament. You got after Daniel, you've got Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. And then Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, in case you're going backwards. Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2. I'm going to read just one verse because there's a phrase in that verse that just, well, I could talk a long time about it. <laughs> um, but I'll try not to. Micah chapter 2, verse 7. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Man, that phrase just jumps out at me right there. Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Man, is that ever the truth? If, if that's ever a test, if I have a testimony, that's it right there. My testimony is not, I did this, I did that, and I got to do this, and I had this privilege, and I had this honor, and I had this, and, uh, and Lord, let, let me, allowed me to do this, and, and the Lord worked in my life to where I was able to go here and go there and, and do this and hear this and see that. No, the testimony of my life is the Word of God has done me so much good. Do not my words do good. Oh, I can give you a resounding, yes, they do good. Woo, yeah, they do. I love the word of God. It has done me so much good. So I want to talk about that and, and sort of uh, identify for those that might be listening either here or elsewhere, how the, the, how the word of God, the words of God have done me good and how they can do you good. Do not my words do good is the title. And of course, it's specifically to them that walk uprightly. Because the word of God is not going to do good to those that don't walk uprightly if they never do. It won't do good to those who do not get saved. Because ultimately, Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 48, If any man receive not my words, if any man reject my words, the same shall judge him in the last day. The word of God is going to be the thing that judges people in the last day. And it's not going to be good because the word of God is going to show that you're a sinner. You never believed the word of God. You never believed the living word of God, Jesus Christ. You never trust him as Savior. And therefore, all your sins are still recorded. Millions and millions of sins, billions of sins recorded. And we got them all in these big old books. And one sin condemns you to hell. Oh, the word won't do good to those that don't walk uprightly. And to walk uprightly means to, to have the righteousness of Christ that comes from above. And uh, because all our righteousness is just filthy rags. But to those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, God sees their faith and counts their faith as righteousness. And he makes them upright in his sight. Why? They will stand. Sinners will not be able to stand in the day of in the judgment. But the righteous will be able to stand because we're going to stand on the promises of God. So, uh, so I'm going to talk mostly about the fact that the word of God does good. The first way that the word of God does good is that it saved my soul. <laughs> it, it did the good work of showing me that I was a sinner. A lot of people don't like to be shown that they're a sinner. But it's good if you're a sinner to be shown that you're a sinner to see it. It's like, isn't it good to have a mirror? Why do you think ladies carry mirrors in their, in their purses? Or, or uh, you know, men don't go around it because we're not that concerned about it. But women, yeah, women are considered the, 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 the fairest of the gender. Uh, of the genders of, of mankind. And so they, they're the fairest. And so their, their beauty means more to people than a man's beauty, if a man has beauty. I don't think of men as being beautiful. 
So, uh, uh, but anyway, so women carry mirrors. Why? So if there's something wrong, they can correct it. See? It's good to have a mirror if it's important for you to look good. And I'm not saying that looks is, is all that important, but you don't want to, you know, if you got mustard down your cheek from, <laughs> you're down your jaw from eating a hot dog, you don't want to go so in and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. What? You're, not, you're a bum. You don't even know how to wipe your chin when you eat. You know, who's going to listen to a guy like that, you know? Uh, so, so depending on what you're doing, the importance of what we have to do is people, because people are going to judge us from the outside, so therefore the outside matters to, should matter to us. Because people are going to judge us by what they see. They're not like God who can look at the heart and see, oh, I see you trusted me as Savior. Okay, I've forgotten all your sins. Other people, relatives, they do remember what you're like as a kid. Okay, relatives, remember what you're like even as an adult. And so you, we've got, that's why we have to change. But the gospel is going to show us that we're sinners. And, and I'm getting ahead of myself. I didn't mean to get talking about change so much as far as our outward con con condition, but the Word of God revealed to me that I was a sinner. It showed my faults. It's like a mirror that, that I look and, and see myself. I see, oh, the Bible says all have sinned. Oh, that's a mirror to me because it means I've sinned. The Bible says there's none righteous. Oh, that means that's a mirror to me. I'm not righteous uh, of my own doing, that is. Um, all my righteous, righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the Bible says. And so... The Word of God did good in that it revealed to me that I was a sinner. It did good to me in that it revealed to me that, that of, of the status that I, my, my potential status, my natural default status, that as a sinner, I am under the judgment of God. And, and, but God's given me a lifetime to learn about Him so that something can be done to change so I move out from underneath His condemnation and I become a believer in Him. So, so the fact that the law tells me, the word of God tells me that there is a judgment for sin, that there is a hell, and that the, 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 what I deserve is to die and go to hell forever, that is good. I mean, let me tell you something, isn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine a police pulling somebody over driving a car? And, and the guy says, uh, why are you pulling me over? Well, it's against the law to wear glasses while you drive. Because... Because your glass might fall off, then you're blind, then you have a crash. So we made a law, but we don't tell anybody. We're just, we're just catching people. We like to catch people. <laughs> and we like to take your money. Uh, this is too close to reality, isn't it? <laughs> but, but anyway. <laughs> but, but what if they did that? What if they made up a law and says, you, you can't wear glasses while driving? Well, oh, man, you, you, you're not going to like it that you did not know the consequences. Oh, and by the way, you got to go to jail for 30 days. <laughs> but I just started a new job. Sorry. <laughs> now, that would be, that'd be wrong. But if that were true, now that's a bad illustration, but if it were true, then you'd want to know it ahead of time so you make sure you have your glasses on when you drive. Isn't that right? If there's a penalty for doing something, you want to know the penalty so you don't do it, so you can avoid paying the penalty. So therefore, though, though all the laws of God are just, they're not unjust like like laws of man sometimes, or the statutes and codes and ordinances that, that man uh, writes that are wrong. Um, God's law is always right, and we do deserve to go to hell because we've sinned against an infinite God who is holy, and we're, He made us in our image, and we're not holy. And just like in, in, in earth, when we sin against a finite person, we pay a finite penalty. But you sin against an infinite God... You have an infinite penalty to pay, and you can never pay it. That's why God, in His love and mercy, became flesh, so He could die and dip His soul in hell and pay an eternity's worth for all of us. So, it's good. The Word of God is good. It told me that I was a sinner. It told me the consequences of my sin, the judgment that I deserve. And then it told me about someone who loved me and knew that I could never finish paying what I owed. So he who is eternal and infinite could do so, stepped in my shoes, was numbered among transgressors, and died, and was judged and smitten of God for my sin. That's what the word tells me. 
See, so turn to Isaiah chapter 53. I'm telling you all this, but I should give you some verses. Wouldn't that be good, wouldn't it? Let me back up a little bit, and I'll just quote some real quick. Romans 3.10 says, There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. And Revelation 21.8 says that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So there is two deaths. Now, so that's what the law shows us. Now, look at, uh, what reference did I give you? Huh? Oh, Isaiah 53. Yeah, I got to get there myself. Got to put a marker there. I reviewed and then forgot what I told you. <laughs> okay, Isaiah 53. This is a great verse, uh, great chapter. It... It's the prophecy foretelling uh, what Jesus would suffer. Look at verse, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Not for his, for, for ours. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, or lack of peace with God, was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Let's skip down to verse 10. Yet it pleased, oh, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. That's why he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death? Yeah, because he's, he who is innocent, he who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 29 or 21, something like that. All right, now look at verse 10. Yet, even though he had, there's no deceit in his mouth, he had done no violence, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And, I, oh, I love this. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Wait a minute. Wasn't it just his body an offering for sin on the cross? That's not all there was. Why? There's two deaths. His body was made of sacrifice, yes. When he died and shed his blood, but his soul was also made an offering for sin in that Jesus foretold it in Psalm 16 when he said to the Father, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jesus suffered hell. His soul went to hell, and his eternal hell paid an infinite price for all of us if we went there forever. But it was not possible that he who created hell should be holden by hell. So he who is an infinite paid an infinite penalty, rose from the dead, and has the power to forgive and save forever. Since he paid an infinite penalty, there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. Amen. Otherwise, why would Jesus dip his eternal soul into hell? I, I, I'm, I'm getting kind of... You know, I, I'm, I'm patient, but I, I, I can lose patience with people who defy so many scriptures in the Bible that teach the security of the believer because they find a verse that looks like, oh, we, well, if, under these circumstances, you can lose your salvation. There is no circumstance where a child of God can lose his salvation. None. Zero. I don't, you say, well, what about this scripture? Well, I can explain every single one of them, but you cannot explain this, that Jesus has sheep. His sheep believe in him and follow him, and he gives unto them eternal life, not temporary life, until they mess up. You cannot explain that away. You cannot explain away when Jesus himself said, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That means there is no way. I mean, I, I'm sick and tired of people doubting the word of God and, and essentially calling Jesus a liar. 
Now, if you're mistaken because you heard false doctrine, fine. But once you study scriptures, you better not be looking for excuse to believe something because you want to be different. You know, so many people, they, they was like, oh, I want, to, I want to have this warning for Christians. You might lose your salvation. You think you're saved and you're not. You're just a proud idiot. Well, first of all, you're a victim. But if you continue in after seeing proof after proof, then you become a proud idiot, a proud fool. And uh, I'm not saying they're, they're not saved. Oh, there are some that are not. But, uh, but some people can just, Christians can, can get proud. But anyway, so I'm glad the, the word of God has done me good because it taught me that there is someone who loved me so much that he did something for me that I cannot do for myself. He paid the price for sin, the full price for sin. Oh, it's done me good because when I heard about that, I put my faith in him. I said, a God who loves me that much. He's got my heart. He's got my body. He's got everything. I'll give him everything. He can have me. Too many people, a lot of people in the liberty movement, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Nobody's going to be my boss. Nobody's my master. I've got a master, and I'll gladly serve him. I'll bow at his feet. I'll kiss his toe. I will not kiss the Pope's toe, but I'll kiss Jesus' toe. I'll kiss every one of his toes. I'll hug his feet, I'll weep, and I'll cry, and I'll wash his feet with my, his feet with my tears if I need to. If I had any hair, I'd dry it, but I, he'll have to just have wet feet when I get done. But <laughs> I got no hair to dry his feet with. But anyway, but yes, that's what I'd do for Jesus, and I would die for him if need be. I love him. Why? His word has done me good. It told me about his love. His love is everlasting. The everlasting God. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. His arms will never get tired of picking us up. His arms will never get tired of catching us when we fall. His arms will never get tired of holding us when we can't walk on our own. He'll never get tired. They are everlasting arms, and they're not arms that go like bullfighters. Ole! <laughs> and let you go. God is not going to say, oh, you're falling again. Ole, I'm not going to catch you this time. No, uh -uh. no, underneath are the everlasting arms. Ah, boy, the word has done me good. God's word has done me so much good because then I found a promise that he gave. Oh, I forgot to give you scripture. Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, God loves us. And of course, we read a lot from Isaiah. And uh, so, oh, let me show you something else. I'm still open to Isaiah. I got carried away about eternal security, but let me show you something else. Look at verse 11. Um, oh, let's, let's pick up where we left off. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Oh, can you imagine how much it grieved the Lord to be considered a liar? He who is the truth was considered a liar. He who is the way was considered a false prophet. You know, Jesus died for false prophets. Jesus died for false teachers. Jesus died for every man and every sin. Anyway, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. You know why Jesus endured the cross and endured hell for us? Because when God made his soul an offering for sin, he saw his seed. He saw. While he paid for our sins, he saw all those who would believe in him. That's what it means, his seed. That means his children. Jesus saw you when he was in hell. And he was glad that he was suffering for you. That's why in Psalm 16 when it talks about uh, that will not leave my soul in hell. Prior to that, he says, 
then shall my heart be glad, and my glory rejoiceth. Why? For thou wilt not leave my soul. So while he's suffering in hell, he saw his seed and rejoiced because he knows that God's not going to leave him there, and he's going to be able to get people to believe in him, and that will allow him to be able to judicially and rightfully forgive their sins because he paid. Oh, man, he rejoiced. Isn't that something? Can you imagine someone, it's like, can you imagine a father having a son getting in trouble at school and some mean teacher say, oh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's ten lashes across the back with a whip. The father finds out that the, the teacher is using uh, a willow stick to, to, to spank the children. And by the way, not that that's so bad. <laughs> I'm not saying that's so bad. But, uh, but can you imagine a father going down to school because he knows his, his child is very weak and, 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 and uh, he's got... Uh, he, he doesn't have a good, strong immune system. And if he gets bruises that, that bleed, he could get infection. So the father goes down there and says, Look, I know my son deserves that, but I want you to beat me instead. Don't you think a father who knows the weakness of his son and knows he could get infection, don't you think that father would gladly take the beating his son deserves? I don't think he's going to say, Oh, 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 oh. I think he's going to man up and, say, and take it. I think he's going to rejoice that, I get to save my son from this. And when Jesus suffered hell, he rejoiced because he saw his seed and he's able to save us. The Bible talks about this in Hebrews chapter 12 too. It says, that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. See, Jesus could see his seed. He could see that someday he'd have the joy of presenting us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That joy that was set before him enabled him to endure the cross. So Jesus actually had joy and gladness when he suffered. Yes, he had grief, but it's mixed. Haven't you ever cried and laughed at the same time? Haven't you ever had sorrow and yet joy at the same time? When my mother, when my grandmother died, man, I was so sad to hear that she died. I loved my mother. I was getting old enough to where I was just, where I was beginning to get to where I couldn't wait to the next time where I could go and talk to her and ask her more questions. I was maturing. I was in high school. But then she died. So I sorrowed because I was going to miss her, but I rejoiced and I shouted, Blessed be God at the top of my lungs in my bedroom when I got the news because I knew she was in heaven. And I knew that's where she wanted to be. But I had mixed emotions, didn't I? And yes, Jesus had mixed emotions. He had grief. He suffered. And he suffered, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He suffered the forsakenness that people are going to suffer when they go to hell. He suffered it in their place. And now they're going to suffer because they rejected his pain. But he also rejoiced because he saw us. He saw his seed. And look at verse 11. I love this. Well, let's see. Let me finish out verse 10. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. All right, verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul. Notice, God the Father shall see of the travail of the soul of, this is talking about Jesus, and shall be satisfied. When God sees Jesus suffering for our sin, and sees the sorrow, and the grief, and the weeping, and the wailing, because why hast thou forsaken me? When God sees that, that his soul is suffering, the amount that we all would suffer if we all went to hell forever, then God was satisfied. Man, I, I, I don't have the words to explain that. I don't have the words to go in the depth of what that means. All I can say is, I know that these words do me good. They've done me good because I believed. And then, and then his word did me good because then I came across verses that prove that all I have to do is believe. I don't have to work. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. It's, it's, it's those, who, who, uh, uh, those that don't, that work, to Him that worketh not, but believeth on Him that justifieth the ungodly. Yes, sir. His faith is counted for righteousness. Oh, the Word has done me so much good. I can't tell you how much. I'm so glad God has saved me. So often, so often I just, I just want to weep and cry out of love and joy and appreciation and sorrow all mixed together. 
Sorrow that Jesus had to die for me, but joy that he did, and that I don't have to go to hell. Thank God for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We wouldn't know about him if it weren't for these words. <laughs> so, do not my words do thee good? Oh, yeah. His words do me good. They've done me a lot of good. All right. Um, let me give you another verse. Turn to Proverbs chapter 22. I love this. Proverbs chapter 22. More proof of the fact his words do good. This is one of my favorite passages now. I came across this and I put it to music. I loved it so much. I put it to tune. Proverbs chapter 22. I might just get so blessed I want to sing it, but we'll see. I'll read it for now. Verse 20 and 21. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty. Man, I like to be sure of things I know. I don't like to be iffy and, you know, I don't like being unsure of anything. You know, unsure is unsettled, is unstable. And you don't know what's going to happen. That's no way I want to live. But he says, Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth? And then he goes on. Now that's personal. That's for me. And I thank God that he has made me to know the certainty of the words of truth. I do not doubt that every word in this Bible, uh, the text anyway, I do not doubt that any one of these words is the words that, of God. I believe God has preserved His Word perfectly, exactly the way we need it in the English language in the King James Bible. I have no doubts about it. I stake my life on it. I stake my ministry on it. I stake my soul on it. Because it is these words that I trusted to be true when I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't put my faith in an idea of some religion. I put my faith in the Word of God. I believed what God said. And I believed He preserved what He said for me because God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't love the Jews and the Israelites more than anybody else. He just chose them and for a certain time in history to be an example of the rest of the world, and they blew it. But God has chosen to save before the foundations of the world anyone who believes in Him. It's not many people did, so He called Abraham out. Of a wicked... His, even his father believed in false gods. Began to believe in all the mythology and, and the constellations. Uh, instead of representing things about God, they began to attribute the different attributes of God that are revealed by the constellation. They began to attribute to different gods, plural. And so the devil corrupted the gospel and the stars, and so it ruined, and false religion was purveying, covering the world. And God called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees, get you up out of your father's house and from your kindred, and go into land which I shall give thee. And he did. That's how the nation of Israel was born. Of course, two generations later, Jacob had the 12 sons, became the 12 tribes, or I won't go into detail of Ephraim and, and uh, Manasseh. But anyway, now, God has given us words of truth. And he will make, he told Solomon, Have not I written the excellent things in counsel of knowledge that I might make thee to know? If you want to know the truth, God will make you to know the truth. If you don't want to know the truth, He has no obligation to make you know the truth. Because if you, because God, the, the things of that are made, creation tells us that there's a God. And if we deny the voice of all creation, God has no obligation to give us His word. So, anyway, the, then He goes on to say, why we need to know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send them to thee. Somebody's going to come to you and say, what is truth? How can I know what to believe? I don't, I'm confused. You seem happy. You seem to uh, think you know you're going to heaven. I don't know. What? How can I know? I just, I just don't. God has given you the words of truth so that you can have the words of truth so you can send, give them to those who send to you and want to know. So, the words of God, they do you good. Not only personally, but they do you good and they enable you to then share them with other people. 
God wants to share His Word with other people. He would command His disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Don't wait for people to send them to you. But if they do, you'll have the answers. And it'll do you good. Let me tell you something. I, like I said earlier during announcement time, I, there's nothing that I enjoy in life more than going soul winning. And winning someone to Christ does me more good than anything. And, 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 and preaching is the next best thing. I love preaching. I love teaching the Word of God. Why? Because it does me good. You know, people don't, I often wonder if people don't believe me when I say this. I'm serious. I love preaching because I know that I'm going to be yielded to God. Um, like I was talking, I was explaining to this uh, young lady, Car Car Carmen, that got saved yesterday. I was telling her about a church services, you know, what to come, you know, what services, how we do different things, different things, Wednesday night Bible study. I was telling her about, about we're studying the book of Proverbs. And then I was told, him, told her how that Sunday morning we have a Bible study hour first and then the preaching service and song, singing and so forth. And I told her, we're doing the word studies on Sunday morning. And this was just yesterday. I said, um, and so I just pick a word, but I trust the Lord to help me know. And I told her yesterday, I don't know what I'm teaching on tomorrow. <laughs> a lot of preachers, they know what they're teaching on for months in advance. You know? Now, if you do a series, you can do that. And I'm in a series, but I didn't know what word I was going to teach on this morning until last night. And, and you say, well, preacher, doesn't that, isn't that cause you fret and worry? Does it concern you? Don't, you? don't you wish you had more confidence and you know more in advance? I don't need to know in advance. <laughs> I don't need much advance notice. If God leads me, that's what matters the most. That's what matters the most. And so I told her that. And you know why? You know what? I got a blessing out of this morning. That's why I love preaching and teaching because I know that God, I know that I'm going to be yielded to God and God's going to lead me and therefore I'm going to get something I need too. <laughs> He's going to get me enlightened and sometimes I get excited from my own preaching not because I like, I, I'm a terrible preacher. I don't like listening to myself because I make mistakes. I lose my train of thought. I get uh, I'll, I'll have you turn one place and give you the wrong reference. I'll substitute someone's name for someone. I, I'm not, my brain is not as clear and as good as other people, but it works good when it comes to principles. I have learned the principles of God. I might get some trivia mixed up and I might tell a story wrong, but I get the principles. It's the principles that matter the most. It's these counsels of God. It's the counsel. A lot of people can give you trivia. They can, they can play the, the, the game Bible trivia. They memorize all the answers. But they couldn't name one principle by which to live. And therefore, that's why you got prisoners, uh, prisons full of people that they know a lot about, about the Bible, but they don't know how to live. They don't know how to make decisions. I got to drink something. Okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Luke 24. Oh, I love this. Luke 24. I'm going to have to sit down. I'm getting dizzy for some reason. I'm, I'm serious. I told my wife I've, I've had, I had two dizzy spells this week. I don't know why. And... Uh, you have to get a microphone over here. Uh, the room's kind of spinning, but I think I can think okay. I just got to make sure I don't fall over. Um, you might, uh, honey, you might want to go and uh, get a little piece of bread, just a small little corner, a quarter of a quarter of a slice of bread. I might need to just eat something. I don't know. I haven't eaten yet today. Uh, that might be part of it. But I was eating twice this week. While I was eating, I got faint. Huh? Oh, yeah, I had a banana this morning. So I think it's probably not that. What's that? What's that? Diabetic? I don't think so. I have glucose tablets for diabetes, and they're little tiny fruit tablets with just a little bit of sugar. Oh, I'll, do, I'll take one of them, okay. sure. Yeah. There you go. I have no idea if I'm diabetic. I don't go to doctors. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I really don't. I don't care if I died. If I plop over, at least, at least you'll have warning. Uh, I'm going to heaven, so I'm not worried about it. But uh, doctors, they just drug you up. 
and uh, then your mind doesn't work. I'd rather mind, I'd rather die and get sick and, and die even if it's a slow death, as long as my mind works. But uh, anyway, let's see, what, what reference did I give you? Oh, Luke 24, yeah. Go to Luke 24. I'm feeling better already. It passed. You know, I, I told her, I said, I had two, two slight fainting spells, just uh, not, not fainting, but you know, just a little bit of dizziness while, while I sit in my office. And both times I was eating, so it's not a lack of food, so it's something else. And then, um, then I noticed last night I had three more just last night while in my office. I'm telling you, I don't want your sympathy, but I feel I have a duty to let you know that something's going on, and I don't know, and I don't much care. <laughs> but uh, as long as I can preach and teach, that's, that's fine. So I'll get, I'll get up in a little bit when, I, when I'm sure I'm, um, it's not as bad as it was a while ago. I mean, it could be something as simple as my, my glasses are, I notice my eyes are changing, maybe my glasses are not right. So when I'm reading and doing glasses too long, maybe, maybe my eyes are reacting to that and I get dizzy for that reason. It may not be anything serious. Anyway, Luke chapter 24, and I'm, I'll cut all this out, I'll edit all this out in, from the message. Huh? Oh, okay, yeah, good. All right. Well, I guess I shouldn't cut all that out because then I have to explain why I'm sitting down, but I'd cut some of it out anyway. Luke 24. And a verse, um, let me get there. Um, <clears throat> let me, let me, t Luke 24 is, covers after Jesus rose from the dead. And, um, boy, this thing really crumbles fast. <laughs> I guess it's good so you get a lot in it. You kind of want to tuck it back in there, let it come out slowly. But it's falling apart, disintegrating, and making my saliva run like crazy. I probably ought to just finish it up, huh? <laughs> Let me just chew it up. Yeah, big old thing. And, uh, oh, I, I just wanted like a little piece. Okay. Some almond butter, too. Okay, sorry to eat in front of you. <laughs> okay, I'm feeling better already. Okay. I'm going to finish this, and then it's like peanut butter, almond butter. Um, all right, Luke 24. Wow, time's going by slower than I thought. Okay, Luke 24. We'll get done early today. Um, this is after Jesus' resurrection. And he's, he's, he's walked along this road to Emmaus because there's two disciples, two of his disciples are going there. Yeah, I'm feeling it again. I better sit down. Ugh, weird. I hate, it's frustrating. Okay. All right, so uh, they might want to just stay back there, Brother Mark. <laughs> um, I'm going to take this off so I can lean back too. Jesus with his disciples and he says, uh, he's walking with them and, and he says, um, in verse 18, no, let's see, um, verse 17. He said to them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Because they're really sad. They just, three days ago, they saw Jesus crucified, their leader, who's taught them for three years. And the one of, and the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. And look at verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this... Today is the third day. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> How many times did Jesus tell them that? Um, today is the third day since these things were done. And I'm going to skip on down because um, my head is really swimming now. 
I'm probably after going to um, look at verse 26. Okay, now I feel like throwing up, so. Uh. 